Today we're in 2 Samuel, we're in chapter 6, we're going to be looking at the entire chapter. So let's begin reading in 2 Samuel chapter 6 at verse 1, we'll read verses 1 and 2 and uh, get into our study. 2 Samuel chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. Chapter 6, as we get into it, let me give you an introduction. Chapter 6 marks the ending of the domination of a people called the Philistines. The Philistines had dominated Israel, but chapter 6 marks the beginning of David's rule in Jerusalem and the end of the Philistine domination. And as David is here now in Jerusalem, he's just captured Jerusalem from the Jebusites and has made it his capital. As David is there, he begins to determine to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem. Now when you read concerning the Ark of the Covenant found in the Old Testament, the Ark represented the glory of God. It also represents his presence in the nation of Israel. And it's time for David to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem, which is becoming the capital city of the nation. And so he makes a determination to bring that Ark. And according to verse 1, he chooses to bring with him 30,000 what are referred to as choice men of Israel. These are battle-hardened veterans. The reason he's bringing these, uh, these warriors with him is because the Philistines may cause some problems. He's not sure whether or not they will, and therefore he brings with him some uh, warriors in the event that there's a problem with the Philistines and they oppose him. You see, for David, bringing the Ark of the Covenant to the city of uh, Jerusalem was extremely important. There are at least two reasons why you can see this. One of the reasons that David wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the city of Jerusalem is simply because he loves God. His bringing the uh, Ark of the Covenant from uh, Baal Judah into the, uh, the city of Jerusalem is simply a demonstration that David had a great love and faith, a devotion to God, because it's God who raised him up to be the king. God had raised him up. He had been a shepherd. He was a warrior. He became a commander. Eventually he became a fugitive and then he became king. God had worked in David's life from the time he was small to the point that he is now there as king in the city of Jerusalem. And David is excited about it and he's devoted to God. He loves God. He's praising the Lord and he is so thankful that God has, has uh, done this work on his behalf. David wrote Psalm 34 verse 1 where it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So David was somebody who was extremely grateful to God. He loved him. He had a passionate faith in him. And so he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the capital city, Jerusalem, so that he might be able to worship the Lord there in the city. And secondly, by bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, David is now going to be able to heal the division that the nation of Israel had been suffering. Remember with me that... Abner, the commander of the army of Israel, had basically divided the nation by encouraging the people of Israel to follow after Saul's son, a man by the name of Ishbosheth. So 11 of the tribes of Israel, there were 12 tribes of Israel, 11 of the tribes began to follow after Ishbosheth, where only one tribe, the tribe of Judah, followed after David. Well, after Ishbosheth had died and Abner is now dead, David is reuniting this nation. And so the 11 tribes that had been alienated from him are now joining with Judah. And so he now is a king over a united uh, uh, nation of Israel. And so what he wants to do is he wants to bring them into Jerusalem to worship in one location. Because when he brings them into Jerusalem to worship in one location, it reminds them that under God they are his people. They are one in him they're once again going to recognize that they're one nation. And so he moves to bring the ark to the city in order that he might centralize worship as well as reunite the, the nation. Now, the ark. The ark has been in a place called Kiryath-Yerim. It's also called Baal-Judah. 
which is a, a small city, a priestly city, that was 10 miles to the west of the city of Jerusalem. It's been there for some time. As a matter of fact, commentators state that it was there for no less than 70 years. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, you see that it was there, it had been there for a little while. Actually, at that time, it said it remained there for 20 years. And the Bible says there, the men of Kiryat Yarim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained in Kiryat Yarim a long time. It was there 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So it had been there and began to be there for 20 years, but ultimately it remained there for a total of something like 70 years. And so after all of those years, David now desires to bring that ark to Jerusalem. And so he goes to where it is in order to bring it to the city. Now again, this is the product of his passion for God. This is a product of his deep love for him. Psalm 103, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is in, within me, bless his holy name. And his desire is to bless the Lord. He has a passion for God, and, and it motivates him to bring that ark to the city. Now, notice in verse 2 how it's called the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts. When it speaks of, of the name, that speaks of the covenantal name that God gave to the nation of Israel. It's, it's called the name with four letters. It's Jehovah, as it's translated today. And it refers to him as the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. That speaks of God's holiness as well as his might. And he is the, he is the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord over human armies. He's the Lord over the hosts of heaven. He's uh, the Lord over the uh, nation of Israel, the celestial heavens. He's the Lord of hosts. And so it speaks concerning who he is. And, and, and this is the ark representing the holiness and power of God. And so they're about to bring this ark back to Jerusalem. And in verse 3 it says, So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And so they're about to bring the ark back. Now, notice with me, they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. As I said, it had been there about 70 years. It had stayed there. Eliezer had consecrated, was consecrated to keep the ark, but we are introduced to two men, Uzzah and Ahio. They were more than likely uh, Abinadab's grandsons. We're going to see something about this in just a moment. Now, notice it says in verse 3 that they put it on a new cart. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and 6... Remember with me that the Philistines had routed the armies of Israel and they had captured the, the ark. And, and when they had possession of the ark of the covenant, God struck them. Many of them died and others developed tumors. And so they got concerned. They wanted to get rid of that ark because of what was going on. So they sent it back. So they put the, the ark on a cart that was drawn by two milk cows. They put in some gold for a trespass offering. They sent it away. And so what happened is that ark returned to the nation of Israel, and it may be that the Jews are now using the example of the Philistines in the carrying of the ark. That's a great mistake, because Israel was not to use the example of unbelievers in their approach to God. You see, the Philistines were not judged on how they handled the ark, because the Philistines were ignorant. They didn't have a relationship with God. They didn't have the Word of God. When you have God's Word and you have a relationship with God, you are held to a stricter accountability than people who are ignorant of those kinds of things. That's why James says, let not many of you become teachers. He says, because you are going to receive stricter judgment. Because the more you know, the more you owe. The more you know, you are more accountable for. The Philistines didn't know that that isn't how the Ark of the Covenant is to be transported. So they placed it on a cart. Israel knew that the Ark of the Covenant was not to be transported that way, and Israel's going to be dealt with because of that. You see, according to the book of Numbers, chapter 3, verses 30 and 31, it says there that the Ark is to be carried by priests from the family of the Kohathites. In Exodus, chapter 25, verses 12 through 15, God said, You shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners, Two rings shall be on one side, two rings on the other side, and you shall make poles of acacia wood 
and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. The poles shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. In other words, the priests were supposed to put the Ark of the Covenant between them as they carried it, and it was to be carried, uh, because they had these rings, the poles going through them, it was to be carried in that way. It was not to be put on a cart. You're going to see something in just a moment. So it says in verses 4 and 5 that they brought it out of the house of Abinadab. So there's now a great celebration. There's music, there's singing, there's rejoicing. The ark is coming to Jerusalem. Worship is taking place. It's a time of praise and rejoicing with all of your might. In 1 Chronicles 13, 8, it says, David and all Israel played music before God with all their might, with singing on harps, on stringed instruments, tambourine, cymbals, with trumpets. And so there's this festivity taking place. You have to get this in your mind. There's thousands of people and they're shouting and praising God and they're worshiping Him. And as this takes place, Something terrible happens. It says in verse 6, When they came to Nahan's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. The ark is being transported. The oxen stumble. The ark is ne nearly dropped off of that cart. And without a moment's hesitation, Uzzah reaches out to steady the ark. Bad mistake. Because Uzzah was a... I mean, I almost... I almost called that... This message was going to be called Uzzah was a... Because he died. He died when he reached out his hand to touch and steady the ark. God struck him and he died. Now, when you think about that for a moment how immediately he was judged, people could say, this is unfair. This seems to be wrong. Why would this man be judged in the way that he was? Well, the answer is very simple. Uzzah, was great. Uzzah had great responsibility because Uzzah was a Levite. He was a priest, and he knew the way it should have been done, and he chose not to do it that way. Because as a priest, he would have had to have been familiar with the Word of God and God's requirements concerning the transportation of the Ark of the Covenant. It's found in the book of Numbers, chapter 4, verse 15. There it says, When Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Kohath shall come and carry them. But they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. These are the things in the tabernacle of meeting which the sons of Kohath are to carry. And so God said, if you reach out and you deal with it in an improper way, you will die. This may have been an apparent innocent misstep, but he was dealt with immediately. Why? Because God made it clear that he is holy, he's to be approached in a certain way, and you're supposed to have a reverential fear of God. In Psalm 111, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Isaiah, God is speaking, and he says in Isaiah 57, 11, of whom have you been afraid or feared that you have lied and not remembered me, not taken it to your heart? Is it not because I have held my peace from of old that you do not fear me? God is saying, who is it that you are afraid of because you obviously are not afraid of me? And is it because I've been gracious and merciful to you for so long that you're taking me for granted now? And you don't fear me? And you don't understand that, that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom? Have you failed to understand that you cannot just come walking up to me and just approach me with a, with a rash indifference. You cannot come to me in that way with this casualness and expect for me to not respond to you. I believe that that mentality still exists, by the way. There are quite a number of people who have a, a casual indifference in their approach to God. And simply because God hasn't dealt with them doesn't mean that God won't. In this particular case, God had given them requirements. He said, the way that you handle the, the, the items of, of, of the ta uh, tabernacle, the way that you deal with those things, it would be done in a certain way. And they, they, they didn't care. Well, the New Testament tells us that the way we approach God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We're told that we can approach God through the blood of Jesus that was poured out for the remission of our sins. That we have a relationship with God because God first loved us and gave His Son for us. 
The Bible tells us that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so I, as a believer, know that it cost something for me to have a relationship with God. And therefore, I don't want to take it in for granted and I don't want to approach it with a casual kind of indifferent attitude. You see, Jesus Christ, when he died on that cross, paid a tremendous price that really was a price I was supposed to pay. Jesus took my sin upon himself. He became the sin offering for me. And so when I read the Bible and I, I read of, of what Jesus Christ went through, just the idea that he left the splendor of heaven to come to earth. We look at earth and we think it's as good as it's going to get. Jesus left heaven to come here with us. It's like leaving a palace and entering into a pigsty. And he came and dwelt amongst men. He took upon himself human flesh. Not only did he go through the discomfort and various things that human beings go through, he ultimately was tortured to the point that he was placed on a cross and died. So how much does God love me? He loves me enough to give his own son that I might trust in him and have a relationship with him. Jesus Christ died on a cross. It's not the cross that's holy, it's Jesus that's holy. Because during the time of Christ, thousands of people died on crosses. It was a Roman means of, of, uh, of uh, capital punishment. That's how people were executed. They were placed on crosses and thousands of people died during the time of Christ on crosses. When Jesus himself died, Jesus died uh, in between two thieves who also died on crosses. It's not the cross, it's the one who died on it that I look to. And the cross is a symbol of what he did for me, a torture, a means of torture and death that was intended to be as painful as possible, prolonging that agony as long as possible. And so as a believer in Christ, I don't want to take the death of Christ and not look at it as a serious, sobering thing in my life. And it transformed me in every way, shape, and form. It made me completely unrecognizable to those who knew me best when I finally embraced the one who died on that cross. And so you don't treat the things of God with a casualness and an indifference. And when Uzzah did that, when he reached over to steady that cart, it may have been something that he thought was proper to do. But God had said, no, no, you don't touch any holy thing lest you die. And he ultimately, was, was, he ultimately died because of that. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. With a confidence I can approach God now because it's a throne of grace that I come to. Grace is not simply permission to continue sinning as much as I want and go to heaven. Grace is the means that God has given to me to be saved and to refrain from sin, to no longer be under the yoke and bondage of sin, to no longer have a life that is, that is earmarked by, known by, to have a reputation of being a particular kind of sinner. Grace has been extended to us in order that we might have a relationship with God. The word grace speaks of an unmerited favor. God has given to us something that we do not deserve. You know, like I've said many times in the past, Today, people think the only thing one has to do in order to enter into heaven is to die. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Like everybody automatically dies and goes to heaven. And it doesn't matter what you were and what you did. You just automatically die and go to heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that in order for me to get into heaven, I need to be born again. And I have a faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross to secure my salvation, poured out his blood to wash me clean from my sin in order that I might have a knowledge of God and a depth of his love. And so an indifference to the things of God is still something that God does not find pleasurable. And that's what took place there. Now as this man dies, notice verse 8, David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah, first Mexican in the Bible right here, <laughs> to this day. If somebody's going to believe me, they're going to write Chicano. No, I'm just <laughs> playing with you. David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. The Lord blessed Obed-Edom Obed and all his household. And two things I want to point out briefly. One, notice verse 8. 
David became angry. Notice verse 9, David was afraid. David became angry and David became afraid. Now who is he angry with? There are those who say that he's angry with the Lord. I don't think so. David was angry more than likely with himself. Because of his carelessness, somebody died. And so he'd be upset for sure, but he'd be angry with himself. The people are now, they're shocked, they're in silence, they're, they're in fear. And as they're there, this, this party scene, this, this celebration scene that was so loud and so excited is now completely silent as they see this body of this dead man laying there in the road. And so David says, let's just take this ark and let's take it to Obed-Edom's house, see if God kills him. No, he didn't say that. We'll take it over there. Obed-Edom is a priest and we'll just leave it there. But as the ark is there, this priest's home becomes blessed by God. So in verse 12, it was told King David saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Well, since Obed-Edom had been blessed, David believes now that it's safe to bring the ark to the city of Jerusalem, and so he chooses to do so. But notice what happens. It says in verse 13, when those bearing the ark, notice it's no longer on a cart. They're doing it the proper way. Those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, there he sacrificed. So as they began their journey, they stopped to offer sacrifices, and then from that point of offering sacrifices, stepping out in faith, going to the city of David, they begin to worship. It says in verse 14, David danced before the Lord. Now notice, with all his might, David was wearing a linen ephod. He danced before the Lord with all of his might, wearing an ephod. A linen ephod was a priestly garment. It was also a symbol of humble submission and service. David is worshiping as one who is humbly submitted to God. It's a symbol of his humility. And the joy that David has that God and he are, are, are good, that everything is all right between them, is spilling out as he's dancing before the Lord. And what he's doing is he's leading the people in praise and worship of God. And as his, his worship is spilling out before them, they begin to join with him. And they too are worshiping God wholeheartedly. And he's worshiping God in, in, in purity and praise. So his pure love and worship for God inspires the people to worship and praise. Now that's the heart of true worship. Sometimes we have people who will say, well, look, I read in the Bible that David danced before the Lord. How come we don't dance? As long as, you know, like they want a holy hokey pokey here in church or something. Uh, how come we don't dance? You know, what we're looking at here isn't David establishing a way to worship? Be careful not to think that. This is not to say that, that there isn't an, a certain exuberance and praise and worshipfulness in, 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 that, that, that is, is uh, sometimes, you know, it's just so expressive because indeed there is. But what David is doing is showing us something that every one of us need to have. We need to have a heart of worship that is pure before the Lord. David was not doing this, in other words, to be seen by man. David was doing this to be seen by God. He was worshiping God with everything that's within him. Now, when you look in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, verse 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Every part of your being, every fiber of you is to worship God. Everything. Let all that is within me bless His holy name. It starts from inside and it works its way out. You see, sometimes we get caught up with, with, uh, with doctrine. We want to make sure that we're, we're worshiping in, in truth, but we also need to worship in spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to move us in such a way that as we are worshiping Him, we're worshiping Him correctly. We're not choosing a pagan style, if you will, like the Philistines carry the ark on a, on a cart. He's not telling us to do that. 
But what we want to do is we want to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. We want to worship the Lord with all that's within us. And so I worship God with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my strength. My beliefs are going to be translated into my behaviors. My creeds are going to be translated into my conduct. You know, and so what God wants me to have is not only doctrine, but he wants me to do. Because what I know is what I do. I am demonstrating what I believe in the way that I live. And David worshipped the Lord with all of his heart. And as he was worshipping the Lord, he was doing it in such a way that, that the people around him had the, the spillover, if you will, of his worship, and they also began to worship God. And that's how it works. The procession is moving, and the Lord is inspiring David to worship. Psalm 95, 2 says, Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Psalm 100, verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And so there they are, worshiping the Lord, singing and praising God. He's so excited. Musical instruments are playing, and David is, is, is dancing before God with all of his might in humble service to him. But notice verse 16. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Michal is, is David's first wife. David had killed 200 Philistine warriors and paid a dowry for her. But her father had given her to somebody else, and she had lived with another man as that man's wife, even after she had married David for nine years. Ultimately, she was brought back to David when David ascended the throne. She was her father's daughter. And she looks down there, and she sees David, her husband, whirling and praising God, and something goes off in her heart. You know, genuine worship can actually cause people who do not know the Lord to ridicule those who do. You may worship the Lord and you praise God, you raise your hands to sing to Him, which is appropriate, it's right. And those who don't know the Lord will look at you like you're some kind of fool, like you're a clown, like there's something wrong with you. And I find that very interesting. Because in our nation, in our society, what is normal is to go to a football game when it's 10 degrees below zero, to take your shirt off and paint your body in different colors and scream for your team. That's normal. People think that that's okay. There's no problem with that. And people, you know, they say, oh, he's kind of goofy, but he's a real fan. People think it's okay to stand in line all night so you can be first to see a Michael Jackson movie. That's okay. But you're kind of crazy if you go to church twice in the same week. There's something wrong with you. That's the way people are. People are that way. You know, they, they, they are caught up with things that don't matter, that ultimately have no eternal purpose. Even the church, by and large, spends more at Starbucks than they give in, 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 in offerings to God because that's the way it is. And we wonder why the world is going to hell in a handbasket. It's because we don't understand how to worship God with all of our strength. We don't know how to worship God with all of our heart, and we don't. We kind of like know how to worship the world, but we really don't know how to worship the Lord. Michal was somebody who's looking at her husband who is full-on worshiping God, and the first thing that comes to her mind is that there's something wrong with him. We'll see this again in just a moment. Verse 17, So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone, a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his own house. David had, had built a tent. And more than likely, it was like the tabernacle. It was a place of worship. And he had placed in front of it an altar, an altar of sacrifice, so that offerings could be made upon that altar. 
And after these offerings have been made, he begins to bless the people and he gives gifts to them so they can go home and continue the celebration. Now after he has blessed the people, notice what happens here. In verse 20, David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. He comes home to his sweet wife. David had just blessed the people. We just read that. He gave them gifts, but he had just blessed the people. He made his offerings to God, but now it's time for him to go home. And as he returns home, what he wants to do is bless his house. His heart is overflowing. It's overflowing with praise to the Lord. And he wants to bring that to his home. But his wife meets him and tries to quench the Holy Spirit. Immediately, she verbally assaults him. How glorious was the king of Israel today uncovering himself. In other words, look at you. You're the king. You took off your royal robes. You put on a lowly ephod. Instead of looking dignified and kingly, you look like a fool. You should be ashamed of yourself. You should be embarrassed of what you did. In David's particular case, it's unfortunate that he came home to that kind of reception. David came home to bring what God had given to him. But you know, that kind of thing happens. It still does. A husband goes to a retreat. And he hasn't been walking solidly with God, but he goes to the retreat. And when he comes home because God touched him, he says to the wife, I really think that the Lord spoke to me, and I really need to get it together. I want to leave the house. And, I, and sadly, sometimes, not always, sometimes, the wife immediately says, Are you kidding me? There's no way. Is this one of those things that you do? You, you go someplace, you get turned on for a weekend, you come back, and, and in two weeks you'll be the same person you were before you left. I'm not going to put up with it anymore. Immediately quenching what God might want to do. The man goes to, a, to a, a men's conference. It doesn't have to be a husband. It could be a son to somebody who's living in the home. God speaks to him. He hears the messages. The messages say, live full on for God. Go home and be a blessing to your family. He comes home. And immediately the people in the house say, I'm putting up with this. Are you kidding me? Just because you think you got touched by the Holy Ghost, you're coming to bring that to me? It happens all the time. I've had women in our fellowship more than once approach me saying, I've been praying for my husband to get right with God. He went to the men's retreat, came back. He, he is right with God. He wants to serve. But now I don't really want him that way. He's too fanatical. He's too busy. He, he, he's doing too many things. I've seen that. I've seen that many times where God can be doing a, a movement in somebody's life where they want to worship God and the spillover is going to be blessings to the home when the wife says, you look like a fool. And how can you be this way? And that's what happened with David. David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. And the people could see that God was moving in him and his worship was true and pure and, and, and it was so real. And, and he stands up before him and he blesses them in the name of God. The Lord bless thee, the Lord keep thee, the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. That was a blessing more than likely that he gave. And he blessed the people. Now he goes home to bless his family and his family doesn't want to receive the blessing. His wife doesn't want it. Now this is interesting what happens here because she says, look at what you did. You are shameless. <laughs> well, David, verse 21 David said to Michal, okay, I'll never worship God again. I'm so sorry. No. A lot of guys do that. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. David rebuked his wife. I know that's not a popular thing to do. God knows you're taking your life into your hands, guys. <laughs> let's face it, let's be honest. 
every marriage has rough spots. Two rivers that were on their own unite to make one. And at the place of connection, there's always a whole lot of chaos. You're dating, and you've got your own path. And you're doing fine here, and she's doing fine there. Then you get to that point where you become one, and when you become one, you now have to learn how to get along as one in the Lord, and it isn't easy. Everything we think, if you have, you know, if you're single right now, stay single, but every person <laughs> that I know, every one of us, every one of us, it's true. Every one of us were doing great until we got married. And then we got married and all of a sudden we discovered things about us that we didn't even know existed until God was gracious enough to give us somebody to point them out. <laughs> and it's always done with a smile. And then what happens is you start having to, to deal with each other the way you really are. And some guys, the way they deal with that is they just close off. You never hear a thing from them. Other guys, it's just a fight constantly. And there's everything in between. You have to find that right place to be able to bring a word of correction. And it does exist. There's a right place to do that. There are times when my wife, my Marie, has, has lovingly rebuked me. And, and, and I have to tell you, She'll say it, and I'll look at her, <laughs> and I go in another room for a while, and I think, then I come out and I say, you know, you're wrong. No, I come in and I say, you know, the Lord has spoken to me, and, and I, need to, I need to deal with that. A lot has to do with the way it's done. There have been times in our marriage where I will, I will bring a word of correction to my wife. I, I will bring a rebuke. David just did that. David just rebuked his wife. It wasn't because he didn't love her. It's because she was interrupting the flow of the Spirit in his life. And therefore, David said, listen, you're concerned? You're concerned with how I look because I humbled myself? I am willing to lower myself even further than I was just a moment ago if I have to. Because I want to love God. Because I want to praise God. Because I want to bless and worship God. And I want to do it with all of my heart. And you need to know, sweetheart, you're not going to stop me from doing that. I will worship the Lord with all that is within me. That's what God has called me to do, and that's what I'm going to do. And just because you think it's undignified for me to worship God in the way that I did doesn't mean that I'm going to stop worshiping God simply because it made you uncomfortable because God called me to worship Him. And that's what David is telling her. He's saying, you're talking to me about losing respect? I'm not losing respect to anybody. They're not going to... They're not going to reject me. They will respect me. I've discovered that to be true too, by the way. There are people who will tell you, listen, you know, keep it to yourself. All right, fine, you're born again. Cool, that's fine. But keep it to yourself, man. Why do you have to tell me about it? Why do you tell people on the job site about it? Why, why do you have to talk? Keep it to yourself. You want to be a Christian? That's fine. I got my own religion. You got yours. Why are you telling me about it? I had a friend of mine named Jim, dear friend of mine. He was the most unhappy guy I knew. And I was a new believer. I was only a couple of years old in Jesus. I had just gotten out of the army. We were jogging together and and I told him, as a friend will tell another friend, I said, Jimmy, you're miserable, man. And he got so mad at me. And he's my dear friend, so he can, and he got mad. Who are you to tell me I'm miserable? I've got joy, man. I got so much joy as he's yelling and spewing and angry. I said, yeah, you look like you're, you're filled with joy. You're a joyful man. They don't, they don't want to hear it. And, and so sometimes what they'll say is they'll say, keep it to yourself. Well, Michal is saying, listen, you want to worship God, that's fine. But you did it in front of everybody. You made a fool of yourself as you were doing so. You're the king. And instead of acting like a king, you acted like a clown. And, and it bothers me so much. And David's response, I will be even more undignified than this. I will be humble in my own sight. I'll come down to the level of the most humble worshiper of God. 
And instead of it causing people to reject, it will cause people to respect me. I've seen that on the job site. I had a job, I had a job where the boss, my supervisor, knew I was a believer. I shared with him. I was a young man. I was only 26 years old. He'd already been married 20-some years. And I shared with him that he needed the Lord. He didn't like it. He didn't like it that this, in his mind, this kid was telling him that he needed God. He didn't like it. And so what he did is he started hiding pornography around where I would find it when I was going through files and things. There'd be a centerfold just to try and cause me pain and grief. I, le I learned a long time ago when you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that barks is the one who got hit. And that's what happened with him. He got convicted. He didn't like it. And the first thing they want to do is they say, listen, your religion is fine, but keep it out of the workplace. Keep it out of the school. Keep it out of the community. Keep it out of the newspaper and the opinion sections. Just keep it to yourself. Michal was saying that to her husband. You are undignified, whirling around, dancing around, you're the king, but you look like a clown. And David says, I will humble myself even more. Look at what God did. By the way, Michal, he removed your father and your family to put me as the king. And you're going to try and get me removed too? And it's, it's not going to happen. And what's interesting too is notice verse 23. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Now, there are those who say that this made David so angry that he stopped having relations with his wife. That could be true, but I, I really don't subscribe to that. David loved her. David wanted her back. David loved her. I think it was one of those moments that a husband rebukes a wife, corrects her. But why didn't she have children? Well, it may simply mean that the Lord withheld her from conceiving so as to keep someone from Saul's line from having a claim to the throne of Israel. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. David from the tribe of Judah. Messiah comes from the tribe of Judah. The Lord withheld her from conceiving so that she would not bear any that would claim the throne, thus cutting off the lineage of Saul. So she never bore a child, not necessarily because David had no marital relations with her, but because God kept her womb closed so that she would not bear a child that would have a claim to the throne of Israel. We need to worship God. This nation needs people like you who are open about your love and worship for God. Don't hide that light under a bushel. Don't allow the world to intimidate you into silence by saying you look ridiculous because the world should not tell me how to approach my God. The world did that in the case of, of Uzzah when he and his brother Ahio were carrying the ark in an improper fashion. The world tries to tell you how to approach God. No, approach God based on what he says. And what he says is you approach him through Jesus Christ. And once you have, then you have a heart of worship that you express before people, not to be seen by them, but as an expression of your love for him. Be sincere in your worship, but don't be ashamed to.